In this video, I'll teach you how to go from a blank sheet of paper to a high-performance suspension kinematics. I'll share many insights into all the steps of the process so that hopefully you don't make the same mistakes I made when I designed my first suspensions. Hello everyone, this is Bruno. In this video, I want to share with you a methodology that you can use to design your suspension kinematics. We're going to be focusing on race cars specifically, and my goal here is not to teach you different parameters from kinematics or how to define their values, but instead a very methodic approach that you can take when designing the suspension pickup points. If you want to learn more about each kinematic parameter specifically and how to define their values, you should watch our video from Claude Ruel on our YouTube channel. When designing the kinematics for a suspension system, our main challenge is, and our main goal, is to find the compromise between all these different parameters. So how can we find, at the same time, the ideal Ackermann, anti-dive, anti-spot, camber gain, roll centers, and so on? For example, when you define your steering rack location, how can you get, at the same time, ideal Ackermann, ideal bump steer, and ideal steering ratios? Here, I show a methodology that will optimize the chances that you find the ideal compromise between all of these different parameters. To make our design even more challenging, we cannot be only looking at kinematics parameters. We also have to be looking at load paths and suspension compliance. For that, it is very good that we apply good practices when designing our suspension. Because if you have a lot of compliance on your system, this will change how the kinematics behaves. And as the Milliken says in their book, everything is a spring and should be treated like one. This means that you have to consider also how to minimize the loads on each of the components so that you have a very robust and predictable system. All right, so let's start designing our suspension. First, we have to pick one of the different design approaches. We have three options. We can be doing the project manually, we can use parametrized files, for example, CADs and Excel files, or we can have the help of optimization algorithms. If we design the suspension kinematics manually, this is a very time-consuming process because we are changing the pickup points until we get the outputs that we want. So as you can imagine, not only takes a lot of time, it is not very efficient, and it's extremely hard to find the compromise between all of those different parameters that we discussed. A much better approach would be to use a parametrized model. This could be a CAD file or an Excel file, for example. In this case, instead of playing with the inputs, meaning the pickup points, until you get to the output that you want, First, you define the targets that you want for each of the parameters, meaning you define the outputs, and this tool should tell you where your pickup points should be in order to get to those outputs. This method is very useful when you are dealing with very specific parameters, so only outboard pickup points, only inboard pickup points. When you're looking at the whole system, using an optimization is a lot more effective. In this case, you can be optimizing all of the pickup points of the suspension at the same time to make sure that you find the best compromises between all different parameters. First, you need to start with a base suspension. After that, we need to define our design objectives. These are the outputs that we would like to see from the suspension kinematics. So for example, we have here, we could be defining our camber gain, which is basically our camber angle versus wheel travel, or we could be defining our bump steer case. In this case, I, I, I want no bump steer, so I'm going to say that it should be zero. These are the design objectives that the optimization will try to find. After that, we need to specify which pickup points we can change. So for example here, I'm showing that we can change the inboard pickup point, and we should also select what is the design space that we have for that pickup point. What is the area that the optimization can use in order to find the outputs that I would like. This design space could be a box, a sphere, or a plane, for example. When defining your design space, you should be mindful of many things. Is it in a good position to attach it to the chassis? Is it near a node on the chassis? Do you have any interference with other systems of the car? And don't forget, take also into account the load path to minimize compliances on your system. Once you defined your design objectives and also your design space, you can run an optimization and it's gonna find for you the pickup points that will give you the behavior that you want. The optimization module inside Optimum Kinematics is a very powerful tool to help you with your kinematics design. Ideally, we should have both a parametrized model and an optimization tool so that in more simple cases that we're only changing a few pickup points, we can use the parametrized model, otherwise we should be using the optimization tool. Now that we selected our design tools, we're going to discuss the simulation inputs. It's very important for us to define not only the static value for each of the parameters, but to define the entire curve. Remember that kinematics is not a point, it is a curve. Therefore, we need to run simulations that cover all the envelope of motions possible for your vehicle. 
So let's define together what motions we want to use in our simulations to analyze kinematics behavior. First, we should start with the obvious one, which is heave or bump. Next, we should be looking at roll, and then pitch, and also steering, including all the range allowed for your vehicle. The next level would be to use combined motions. So you could be analyzing the car in roll, but at different heave levels. Why is this so important? Let's say that you are taking a low speed corner with minimum downforce. The car is up higher, meaning that the car is rolling at a high heave. But if you go to a very fast corner, the car is also rolling, but at a lower heave. The kinematics behavior can change significantly between these two conditions. And therefore, running combined motions, for example, roll at different heave levels or steering at different heave levels can be very powerful. As you can see here, I show a plot of Ackermann versus steering for different heave levels. It is important that we check, is the Ackermann changing a lot between different speeds? Is it something that I want or I do not want? Same for the steering ratio, is it changing a lot between different heave levels? If my roll center is behaving well at the high heave level, it doesn't mean that we will necessarily behave that well at the lower heave level. Lastly, we can also be performing either track replace, where we reproduce an entire lap in our simulation software, or specific corners to understand as you pitch, heave and roll and steer all at the same time that all of the parameters are behaving the way we want. All right, so we discussed what motions we want to use, but what is the range for each motion? How can we define that? So let's do that together. So first of all, you need to understand the car type that you are designing the suspension for, because this will dictate what ranges we want to use. So for that specific car type, is it a GT3? Is it a prototype? Is it a Formula car or a Formula student? For each type of car, you should define a target row gradient and a target pitch gradient that you plan to achieve when designing your springs and entry roll bars. Next, we need to estimate what is the maximum lateral acceleration and longitudinal acceleration that this car should achieve. Also, what is the downforce level that the car will see at the track? What is the maximum downforce that it could see? With all that information, considering the stiffness of the car and maximum lateral accelerations, we can understand what ranges the car will see on track, and then we can use that range. So let's put some numbers on it. Let's say that we're designing a GT3 car, and we define the roll gradient target to be 0.5 degrees per G, meaning the car is rolling on its suspension 0.5 degrees for each G of lateral acceleration. We also estimate that this car will take up to 2 Gs of lateral acceleration. If we multiply the roll gradient by the maximum lateral acceleration, we'll find the maximum roll angle that this car should be seeing on track. So this means that it's 1 degree of maximum roll. If we want, we can use a wider range. Let's say that a specific team is running the softest setup or they disconnected the intro bars, so this could increase the roll angle a little more. So we could be running a simulation, let's say, from plus 1.2 to minus 1.2 degrees of roll. You can repeat the same for pitch gradient and also heave motions. If you have previous data from the car or from a similar car, that is even better, because then you can validate that this is the range that you see at the track. All right, so first we defined our tools and we also defined simulation inputs. What is the next step? Next, we can start the real design. So here I'm going to discuss with you step-by-step step what pickup points you should be working on first and then which ones you should be leaving for later. Remember that here I'm not focusing on explaining to you each of the kinematic parameters or what values we should have, but instead only the order that you should follow when designing your suspension. First, we start with the parameters that are more fundamental and isolated before moving to the pickup points which are changing more things on the suspension kinematics. This means that it is more effective and it requires less iterations to get to the final result you would like to have. First, we should start by defining the general dimensions of the car and tires. Next, we'll look at the outer pickup points of the upright, since you have more isolated parameters there. Next up, we'll discuss the inner pickup points, because inner pickup points are changing most of the behavior or most of the parameters that we have. Next, we'll look at actuation, so defining first our rocker and coilover, and then our anti roll bar. Lastly, we're going to iterate and understand how one area is influencing the other. For all the steps here, I'm going to be focusing on a double wishbone with rocker actuation with an anti-roll bar. But the principles can be applied to other suspension types as well. First, we're going to define the general car dimensions. We don't need to be extremely accurate in the first iteration, but we need to have a good idea. We're starting with defining wheelbase, front and rear wheel tracks. Then we need to estimate what is the mass of the car and CG height. 
as well as the brake torque distribution. This is important for us to calculate our anti-features. Once this is defined, we can now look at our tires and rims. What is the size of the tires and the rims that will define the packaging or the area that we have to design our upright? Remember that your rim offset will define where your contact patch center is compared to the wheel bearing. And by aligning that, you can minimize loads on the bearing. Remember that it's also very important to understand your tires, especially if you have a tire model. This is very important before we define other outputs. So what is your tire requirements in terms of camber and also in terms of Ackerman? Lastly, before we move to designing the pickup points themselves, let's think about what are the packaging challenges that we have in our case. Where in the chassis can we be mounting the suspension pickup points to be close to nodes of the chassis and minimize compliances? Where are other systems such as engine, transmission, and drive shafts? This means that it is important that you have an initial CAD model of your vehicle with the main components of it already assembled. Once we have all that out of the way, we can start designing our pickup points. We are going to start with the outer pickup points on the upright. As I said, these are more isolated parameters. This is why we start here. First, we'll define what mechanical trail and scrub radius we want for steering feedback. And then we are going to also define what combination of caster and kingpin we want in order to achieve the camber variation with steering that we want. Now we need to select the pickup points to get to these parameters. We'll start with the front view. As you can see, first we define a kingpin angle and we also define a scrubby radius. With this information, we already know what axis in the front view should contain both outer pickup points of the wishbones. Next, we look at it from the side view. We also define what caster angle we want and the mechanical trail meaning that, again, we know in which axis these two points should be contained. If we put both of these together, we can find the specific pickup points on the upright. It is important that we keep in mind any possible interferences with other components, such as brake discs, calipers and ducts. As it becomes clear now, we are not defining inputs such as the pickup points or even the caster and kingpin. No, first we are looking at outputs and then understanding what parameters we need to get to these outputs. In that way, it is very powerful to use a parametrized model to help us with this reverse engineering. But also, using an optimization algorithm is even more powerful because instead of only looking at static values, we are looking at the entire curve. So we are not only looking at the static mechanical trail, we are trying to optimize the mechanical trail for different heave levels or different steering levels. Now that we define the first version of our outer pickup points, we start designing the inboard pickup points. Since these pickup points will influence even more parameters, it is good that we have first the outer pickup points defined. For the inboard, we are going to look at it as front view and side view. We start with the front view. In the front view, we want to define the instant center positions. Because as you can see in the figure, the instant center will de determine where the wishbones should be pointing to. In order to define the lateral position of the instant center, we have to decide what camber gain we want. If we want more camber gain heave and therefore less camber gain or less camber variation in roll, we should use a shorter distance. If we want less camber variation in heave but more in roll, then we could use a longer lateral distance. Once you define your roll center, your instant center should be on the line connecting the contact patch and the roll center. All right, so now we have both our instant centers and also the direction that our wishbones should have. Next, we are going to look at side view. In order to completely define the pickup point inboard locations, we need to also look at the side view. Here, again, we're going to focus on the outputs, which are anti-features and also pitch center. So what is the anti-dive, anti-squat or anti-lift that you want for each of your axles? Defining this geometry will determine the inclination of the, of the wishbones on the side view. This will again give us the instant center position. Now that you have defined both the front view instant center and the side view instant center, you can connect these two points with the point on the upright and this will define a plane. As long as you place your pick wishbone with pickup points on this plane, you should have the expected behavior that we just defined. Be careful, even though the static value will be the same, depending where you place these points specifically can change the variation of this parameter. And remember what we said, kinematics is not about a point, it's about a curve. So we have to be mindful of this variation. Once you do that for upper and lower wishbones, you will have defined completely the three pickup points for each wishbone. The last inner pickup point that we have to define is the steering rack position. For the steering rack position, not only you have a packaging challenge, you need to make sure that you achieve the Ackerman that you need, as well as the bump steer and the steering ratio that you want. 
A very good initial guess to minimize your bump steer, in case you want to minimize bump steer, is to have your steering linkage pointing towards the instant center of the front view. Once you have this starting point, then you can play around a little bit with this pickup point to minimize bump steer even more. Now that we're done with all of our inner pickup points, we can move to the next session, which is defining our actuation pickup points. We're going to start by defining rocker pickup points as well as coilover pickup points. It is very important here that we try to minimize the loads and compliances on this system. For that, the first thing we should keep in mind is that every pickup point of the actuation system should be all on the same plane. Otherwise, we're introducing twisting moments on the rocker. Next, again, we should define first the outputs before we can look at the pickup points. For the outputs here, we should be thinking for both coilover and entry bar, we should be thinking about the motion ratios that we want, static motion ratio, but also extremely important is the motion ratio variation with heave. So as you change the vehicle height, how is your motion ratio changing? This is so important because this means that if your motion ratio is changing, your stiffness level is changing as well. And this can be very bad if not designed intentionally for a race car. To give you an example, let's say that between a low speed corner and a high speed corner, the car is lowering because of different downforces. And let's say that in this case, the rear motion ratios for both the spring and the entry bar are stiffening the rear axle. This means that as you go towards high speed corners, the car is getting more oversteer, which is not something that we necessarily want. So we have to be very careful with this, because if you don't design your actuations correctly, it could be that between a low speed to a high speed corner, you could be a change of stiffness of even up to 20%, which is huge in terms of car balance. If that happens, it's very hard for the teams at the track using your race car to get proper balance. Speaking of the rocker, how can we define motion ratio levels? It is mostly influenced by the distance that we have between the pivot point on the rocker and the push rod or pull rod versus the distance that you have between the pivot point and the rocker. Not only that, but the angle of the push rods and the rocker will also be influential. For the motion ratio variation, it is all about angles. If you have very different angles between your push or pull rod and your rocker, the motion ratio variation can be very big. And I don't mean that motion ratio variation is necessarily bad, it just needs to be designed intentionally. This means that you can play with the angles of each of these components to achieve the motion ratio variation that you want. For the end row bar, a similar analysis is also valid. The angle between the droop link and the rocker, as well as the angle of the droop link with the blade, will influence the motion ratio variation that you have. Once we have defined our actuation pickup points, we can go to the last step of this process, which is iteration. First, we're going to check with interferences with other systems in the car. We have to make sure that we're covering all of the possible motions of the vehicle and making sure that we have enough clearance for those parts. Next, we have to understand that each pickup point will influence multiple parameters. This means that if we change any pickup points on the upright, it might mean that we also have to change pickup points on the chassis and vice versa. For example, let's say that you had to change the steering rack position for whatever reason. This will induce bump steer that needs to be adjusted on the outer pickup point of the tie rod. Also, if you made changes to the pickup points of the wishbone on the upright, it will change the instant center, roll center, and other parameters, meaning that you have to readjust on the inner pickup points to go back to the same values that you wanted. All right, so now we have the first version of our suspension kinematics to submit and show to the other designers involved in the project. Be ready, because once they fit your system to the entire vehicle assembly, they will come back with feedback with parts and pickup points that you have to change. And this is why it is so important for us to have automated tools that we can run quickly multiple iterations of our design. Because we are going to be designing the suspension not only once, but at least 15 times throughout the design process. And this is why investing time in developing your tools or using proper tools is very important. I hope that the methodology that I just shared with you will make your design process a lot more effective, fast, that you reduce the number of iterations and that you can find, as we said from the beginning, the ideal compromise between all different kinematic parameters that we have to design. If you like this content, you could be interested in our seminars. So we offer a vehicle dynamics seminar where we discuss for multiple hours how to define each of the kinematic parameters that we discussed in the video, besides lots of discussions in tires and vehicle dynamics. We also have a performance engineering seminar focused on car, driver and tire performance, where we discuss many different data analysis techniques that can be used to improve the car design we are working on. You can find the link to the calendar in the video description. And these are the services that Optimum G offers. 
Vico Dynamics Consulting, where we could, for example, be helping you design the kinematics of your car. We also offer simulation software in the areas of kinematics, with optimal kinematics, tires, and vehicle dynamics, and performance engineering, where you could have one of our engineers at the track with you. Thank you for watching the video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section so that I can get back to you, and I'll see you in the next one.